Hi, podcast listeners. Thanks so much for coming to visit my eco-friendly home today. I'm your host, Madison Hopkins, and I'm so delighted to have you. When you're a guest in my eco-friendly home, I want you to walk away with tangible steps to reduce your home's emissions, live healthier, cleaner, save money, and of course, build community. So come on in and make yourself right at home. Oh, goody, you brought those low sugar cookies I love. My favorite. Hi, podcast listeners. Thanks for tuning in to today's show. As my guest here on Eco-Friendly Homes, we have Cheryl Seiko. Cheryl is an amazing person who I am lucky enough to have found online. She is a licensed architect with more than 30 years of experience and the founder of avoidingmold.com, which I'm super curious if that domain name was just available for the regular price of 12 to $9, or if you actually had to <laughs> pay a pretty penny for that one. <laughs> but all jokes aside, she has a personal story related to mold and other toxic exposures that has affected her health and the health of her family and the health of a couple of her clients that I've also been following online. Cheryl's personal and family recovery could not have happened without the knowledge she has gained through her own education, professional background, and continued research in a very research-intensive field. Cheryl shares her experiences, lessons learned, and resources to help others improve their health through attention to environmental toxins, especially those related to water damage and mold in buildings. And so Cheryl, I'm so excited to have you here as a guest today to talk exactly about that water damage and mold in buildings. Thank you, Madison. It's great to be here. And I'm really excited to, I'm always excited to talk about the topic. It's a little bit of a drag sometimes because <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, it's got its negative sides, but my mission is to create awareness and to share information that can help people so that, yeah, so this checks the box and more people that learn about this. And I, I honestly learned about it from, you know, they're kind of just a divine intervention. Something happens and something else happens and you hear you some you're in a situation where you hear about something and it sometimes changes your life so yeah yeah do you want to dive into your personal story first um sure my my personal story that where my life kind of got changed by something I'd heard was basically 16 17 years ago and when people are listening to this Sometimes all this stuff lives forever, but I had one of my children had full on asthma at home and at school. And we were living in a, an older home that we had just purchased about six months before. And she started having migraine headaches. She also had rashes, but she was sick everywhere she went. So why would I think it was in my house? Plus I'm an architect. So I had inspected the home and I didn't see any defects that were readily apparent. There was no water in the basement and there was really nothing um, to see it was actually an unfinished basement so a lot of stuff was was exposed and i went to a ceu presentation so continuing education presentation for architects which is required for me about 12 hours a year and i went to one on molding commercial buildings and there at, you know so i heard some things there that changed my life because i didn't know all these things about mold and the way they could affect people that i ended up learning through that presentation that I attended, which is basically that you can be sick anywhere, you can be sick everywhere, but you're still being exposed somewhere where you're probably sleeping or spending a lot of time. And I always thought it was like, oh, well you walk in and oh, I feel like I'm having a fuzzy head or my eyes are watering and sneezing. And so now I need to leave. So I know I'm allergic to that place. No, it wasn't that, I mean, she was fine initially. So I didn't know it was that insidious that it could actually be that you feel fine and little by little, your body starts having these little reactions where you don't even connect it to the place that you're at. Then the other part that I learned was that you could have mold in your ductwork. So I said that I kind of tested everything and looked around. I did not remove the, the vent covers and I did not consider the ducts. I didn't know you could have mold growing in, on your ducts because they're metal. A lot of people think that oh, I'm going to do a building with metal studs because I'm trying to avoid mold. No, mold will grow on metal. Actually, it'll grow on every possible material that we have in our arsenal to use in building buildings because wow. the food source is dirt and, dirt and dust. And I did not know that. Moisture is what we can control. 
not the dirt and dust. And so we ended up realizing that it was in our ductwork and it's a long story. I have a, a webinar on cleaning ductwork that I tell this story more in depth and show pictures of my family at the time and some of the mistakes that we made in that presentation, but also lessons learned. So not only did I hire a scam company that made it worse, then I, I contaminated, my kids got, I had kid, kids that had ADD, I had kids that had mold rage, which is another symptom I learned about later. I didn't know at the time that it could affect your brain and how your brain works. It could affect your mood. So I had one child that was like breaking things all of a sudden, getting angry and then losing oh, wow. their temper. And it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And I didn't connect at all. And we did have some autoimmune diseases in the family and those continued to be a problem. So I don't know that I really connected that either, but yeah. So then I learned how, once I hired the bad duck cleaner and recognized it and kicked them out and then, then did a lot more research to figure out what duck cleaners are supposed to do. So this has happened to me time and time again, where it's like, okay, well, I guess I have to learn how to be a duck cleaner. So what are the best practices for duck cleaning and research all that? And that's the kind of things that I share. So some of it that I share with people is stuff that I learned from my background. I've been licensed for over 30 years. I do 12 hours of continuing education, like all that time. And I, and ever since this happened to my child, I focused my continuing education on building science. And so she did recover. We did get it finally cleaned the right way and cleaned up the mess and she did recover. It took about a year and we had some setbacks along the way, like staying in a moldy vacation rental that we should have immediately left lesson learned next time that ever happens. And we notice we've mold in some place. We are not staying. We will leave. We stay. So that kind of thing that we learned, but she did recover. She does not have asthma. She she was 10 at the time and she doesn't, she never had asthma again after that. She got rid of the inhalers. She still is very sensitive. And so we went on for the last 16 years and, and moved her four times. I think college is rough. Anybody who's in college and wondering about mold in their dorms or in their, their classrooms. Yeah, it's a thing. It's a really big problem. And so we had to deal with that. And there were times when it was a week's notice and like, hey, we got to find her another place to live. This isn't working. And there were times when my husband, actually, she was in France. It's all around the world. So she lived in France for a stint and had mold there in an apartment. And so my husband had to go and rescue her and help her move because she fatigue and brain fog and depression and insomnia, low energy are all related. So, so it comes in less as like a, it's more of a slow thing. Like within a week, you'll know, but you're having symptoms of it, which is what, what the alert is. Yeah. We were there for six months before we knew, but it was summer when we moved in. So, you know, kids are outside and windows are open a lot and we did have our conditioning, but then in October is when it started. So we've started running heat. And this happens for a lot of people when you change seasons, because the, the heating season, actually mold doesn't like that season because it's very dry. It's much more drying. And, and so if they're starting to dry out, they're, they're getting, not getting a little worried about that. And they actually put out more spore, spores to go find new places that are wet to land so they can keep reproducing their species. And so there tends to be, I think, a lot of reactions at the, at the shoulder seasons. So people may notice in October, or they may notice in the spring when you switch over to air conditioning from heat, when now you're introducing humidity, that they're starting to have more symptoms. So, but it is, it's very difficult and people, there's, we didn't think anybody else was having symptoms. This was later when I started researching and saying, whoa, I wonder if that ADD, I wonder if that rage thing, I wonder if the autoimmune diseases were related in in retrospect, I do believe that they were. Wow. And then we went on to have some mold lime exposure. And that's how I came to do this work is that I had researched, I was researching Lyme disease online for my husband who was very sick. I actually had it also, but not as sick as he. And so I was researching Lyme disease online and seeing all the people talking about mold illness, which appears to be connected. So people who have Lyme disease often don't recover well if they also still have a burden on their immune system of the toxic air quality, which is 
usually associated with mold, or at least in many cases is. And so without removing that burden, it's hard to actually recover well, at least. So when people do indoor air quality tests, does that generally test for mold? And, and does that show up as something? Or would you have to go through and on some of your YouTube videos and for listeners out there, Cheryl has a great YouTube channel that I actually subscribed to today. And it is called Cheryl Seco Architect. And that's C-I-E-C-K-O. It's a little tricky to spell and I've never I think it, it. it's I don't have a stage name so <laughs> if, if you put in Cheryl architect mold I think I come up and I think you can get to my YouTube channel from my website which is okay mold.com well that would so, make sense yeah um so I if, it, if we don't then let me know because we gotta fix that um I'll let you know so your question again but was yeah, so well, just detecting mold as far as like indoor air quality tests, because I've had a couple other podcast guests who do like home energy audits or indoor air quality testing. But on your YouTube channel, I watched one of your videos where you do the, the moisture meter. And so you actually have to put the meter. It's almost like a stud finder, but for moisture. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, air, air tests may find something. Dust tests may find something. And I would definitely consider it if you found something using those tests. Just know that they're screening tests and they also can miss mold lots okay. of times. So it's a moment in time. And if you don't find mold with those tests, then all you know is you didn't find mold on that day at that time with that test in how you did that test. So is and, mold sort of like, is it very tricky like that? Like it can show up higher on some days and less on some days, sort of like what you were saying, like when you heat the house, it's going to show up less, but it's still there. Yeah, it can have to do with air currents. And so if somebody had the windows open the day before, and then they close the windows to do an air, to do an air test, well, it's been very dilute. There's also, we don't really know for sure when they're, it, but it's, I think like pollen, mold is a little like pollen. And we, when they, they put out something called mycotoxins, which is probably the toxic portion of the mold that is not something we can see and very difficult to measure if measurable at all. And people do test it in their blood. So that would be another test people could do is test their body and do some blood testing. And then it, and then you kind of know like, okay, it looks like I'm being exposed to mold, but now where? So, but they might be like pollen where they're putting out their babies in the middle of the night. It might mm. be, you know, who knows when they decide that they're going to be reproducing and actually affecting the air quality more than another time. There's also a lot of mistakes that can happen in the, any kind of testing there's some false positives, but most of them are, are false negative kinds of uh, testing. And it's even possible for people to intentionally not find mold. So for instance, running a test for too short of a time or not doing an accurate indoor outdoor comparison or some of the interpretation of tests I've seen. And, and I, I have a different interpretation than someone else of what they saw and I said, well, it looks to me like you actually have a problem. But the, the person who did the analysis says, oh no, it's all good because there's a number. So what people have to realize is there is no standard around mold testing. There are people who have guesses, I guess I would say, that hypothesize that there's this, that, and the other thing. On the air test, they certainly say, you know, do this and this is a rule of thumb, but it's not an absolute. So it can be a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack and you feel like I know it's here, but I can't quite find it. I would tell people that if you smell a musty smell or even an off smell, a bacteria goes with mold and it can have a sweet smell. It can have a sour smell and mold can be like any color on, in the rainbow. There's white mold and there's black mold and there's green mold. And so there's all these different colors. There's some mold people see in crawl space. It looks like lint. Oh, mm -hmm. the crawl space is good. There's nothing down there, just some lint. Mm. And, and somebody's not thinking, where did that lint come from? Sure. Maybe it's not lint. <laughs> Maybe it's actually some fibrous stuff of mold. So we have to keep in mind that individual mold spores we can't see. And by the time we can see them, there's probably tens of thousands of them in a cluster for us to see, which can be very toxic. So I don't usually, and since in my research, what I realized is that mold can't live without water. So it's the moisture that is really the issue. 
And, and if we find the water, if we find water damage or potential water damage, then we can often find where there's mold that's concealed that no one has considered or, or found because these screening tests didn't find it. Hmm. I would say in the test though, if you do the test and it says it's positive, then I say, I would believe that because they found something. And it's hard to say that it wasn't there when they actually found something. It's easier to have where, well, we didn't find anything, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. It's just that day, that time. The tests are very short, you know, five minutes of air testing. And then where are you going to test? You know, it could be over here. It could be over here, low, high. And those are all variables that I would in an educated way suggest if someone was going to do testing, I'd first be looking for the moisture and say, I would test over there in that corner near the wall. And I maybe even knock on the wall a little bit so we can wake up anybody who might be sleeping in there to come fly around. But I would at least be saying, you know, there's this part of the house, there's a wall that looks like has the potential to have damage. And that's where I would, I would test in that room. Or with the dust sampling, you might want to, sometimes they do that over the whole house and then they get a positive, but you actually have no idea like where, because they did the attic, they did the basement, they did every other room in the house and they got a little dust everywhere. And so great. It seems like there might be mold somewhere, but we don't have any clue where. So what is that? What do we do with that? Well, we can't do anything. If we know we have moisture problems and moisture will never be a good thing. And I'm usually looking for building defects that cause moisture. So that's where my background comes in. And it's different than other people's that are in the mold space. Sure. And, and I've just used the tools that I have that's from my background and my education, which is to look for, well, where's this broken? Where, what's wrong with this building? Could that lead to a problem with water? And then I back in from there and say, well, do you have health issues? Do you have symptoms? well, this isn't right on your buildings and look at this. It doesn't look good. And looking for anomalies, things that don't look like other things. And then, then I would say, well, this is how you could diagnose it or test it. In some cases it's in concealed mold, it's opening something up and yeah. take drywall's cheap. So people don't yeah. realize that either, that, you know what, just look at how much a sheet of drywall is even today, even as things prices are rising it's really not that much money. And so you have somebody who knows how to open the drywall that can put it back without ripping out the whole wall. And that's what you would wanna do, but then you'd also wanna protect yourself. And so I talk about that. I have a remediation course that I talk about that. I have a cleaning course that actually my daughter did a section on removing carpet in there because she, she did it herself. And I said, oh, can you take pictures when you're removing that carpeting in your apartment? that and she did it one time with my father who's 80, who was 85. So <laughs> if they could do it, anybody could do it. And yeah, then she, sure. she did her roommate's bedroom another time with her roommate and her boyfriend, her boyfriend, her roommate's boyfriend. And, and, and that's when she documented it and helped me make some slides to say, step one, step two, and this is what you do. And this is how to protect yourself. And, and so you can, you can do some of those things. So I, I try to make recorded information based on common questions to be as affordable as possible for people and they can watch it anytime. Yeah, that's really awesome. So that that's sort of soothing that you could do it yourself if you needed to do mold remediation yourself. You don't yeah, in most it. states, you, it's actually legal. In fact, there's very few states that have laws around remediation that are regulating it. I think last time I checked, there were seven oh, out wow. of 50. So it's really the wild west. And and, you have, and that's important to know that there really aren't any regulations and that so when someone comes and says, oh, no, absolutely, this means this, that you want to ask. And where does it say that? <laughs> you know, because, oh, I just know because I learned in a class wouldn't be a good answer. It's, it's, you really should be able to find the, the answers that you're looking for. And, and I've searched for them and realized that no, 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 it's, there are no standards. Everybody's guessing and trying to figure it out. Even the protocols are, they're recognized by the industry and I think they're consensus standards and those are good. And I definitely would recommend following those, but a lot of people don't even know what they are, even though they say they follow them. So I've researched those just like the duct cleaning. There's a duct cleaning association that would be good to follow. And there's remediation associations, just I think three or four that are, are well-respected. 
Why do you think it's not very well regulated? Well, because I think it's not really even well understood the health effects. Mm -hmm. So we regulate asbestos now and we regulate removal anyway, asbestos removal, we regulate lead removal, but we didn't always. So there was a time when you know people were putting up DDT wallpaper on their walls to keep bugs out of their children's rooms. It was off gassing DDT. And that's wow. highly toxic. That was in the 50s. I have I have a picture of a, of an ad for that from the what 50s. Is DDT? I'm not I'm not DDT familiar. is like Agent Orange kind of stuff. It's what they used to spray for mosquitoes, and the kids would run after the trucks being sprayed and they would get cancer in their in their adult lives oftentimes. I've actually heard about that. Yeah. And being from Louisiana, I live in Denver, Colorado now, but we still have spray trucks that go around our neighborhoods in Louisiana and spray for mosquitoes. And I've, I've never looked into it, but I'm always like, hmm, you know, there's no warning signs or anything. They just spray and then they go. Yeah. But it's probably not DDT anymore. It's been regulated since when they realized the health effects, but we're, it's all learning. Everything we do is learning. Our building codes are, are based on tragedies. Mm. So whoops, all these people died in a fire because the doors swing in. And so they're all pushed up against the door to escape and they couldn't. Hmm, we should regulate that and make sure that exit doors swing out. But there are definitely stories before that was regulated where a lot of people were killed being forced up against doors that were swing that they couldn't open because everyone was pushing on them to escape mm. and there's there's a lot of that so a lot of what we do is is we're learning and i think the mold in our buildings is an unintended consequence of the sustainability movement which is a good thing i mean i like the environment as much as everyone i'm actually i actually used to teach courses about sustainability for the wood industry and for my peers but we didn't, we started doing things that were very technical and suggesting them in buildings without changing how we built the buildings themselves. And so, so yeah, like what, what do you mean that, because I wasn't familiar that mold happened because of the sustainability movement. Like, what do you mean by that? What did we implement that made buildings more susceptible? And you said it's been since like the 1950s that we've been having... Well, no, it started in the 70s with the energy crisis and we started, and then we started insulating. And so we, we keep trying to do good things. It's unintended consequences of good things. And yes, these are good things, but we don't always know the repercussions of the things we do that we think are good. Yeah, um, I hear stories all the time about even electric and solar and batteries and what does it take to actually make a battery and who's impacted by making batteries to store electricity. Yeah. And are we thinking about that while we're moving forward? Maybe not, because it seems we get very excited about our the prospects of saying sustainability. Like when add weather strip and add insulation and oh, it's gonna be, you know, so much energy savings and, and all that's good. We want to do those things. But we don't always know what's gonna happen that's maybe not be the right, you know an unintended consequence that's poor until it actually happens like whoa we didn't think about that that you know this was happening or that was happening and that's that's really we had mold i mean mold goes back to biblical times so it's not like mold is just started in the sustainability movement mold is everywhere in the environment and we've always had it it's just that we've tightened up our buildings in some cases over moldy or around moldy or trapping moisture in a way that now our really tight buildings have some contaminated air in them where drafty used to allow us to be a little healthier because there was tens of thousands of holes in the wall and when the wind blew it dried things out and also fresh air was getting in whether we liked it or not you know whether it was cold or not <laughs> we still got got fresh air and you wore warmer coats and blankets inside and all the rest of that and now it's like oh wow it's we've really tightened everything up but we didn't fix what the problems are or we didn't really know necessarily that you know all our walls are actually leaking wow if we tighten it up and then they want to dry to the inside which is a thing i have a course called a mini course called moisture basics that i i highly recommend for people that is a, basically the fundamentals of all the ways that our buildings get wet and there's ways that people don't think of and then and how all these systems work together 
So we often end up talking about the materials and saying, oh, I don't want to use drywall or I don't want to use wood. I want to use this mold resistant material mm -hmm. and not realizing that all of our buildings are systems of materials put together and where the materials come together is often where the problems are more so than the material itself. And then that whole point I talked about earlier of with, if you have moisture in there and it can be moisture from humidity that um, dirt and dust is a food source and we can't really control that. Most of us are building laboratories and surgical suites. So, and they have a hard enough time. There's mold in hospitals if you research that. So it's a tough problem. And that's part of the reason why it's, it's growing is because it's not going to be easy to fix. It's very, very complicated. And, but it, what I'm, what I'm working on is, is for us as homeowners, as home buyers, as home renters, as people who struggle, are working on their health to say, to learn about some of this stuff. And then we can start driving changes from the ground up and maybe there will be code changes. I think there's some code changes that are needed. There's some clarity. Are you seeing any research for, I mean, I'm sure there's gotta be research for change. And then you said there are some code changes, but like, are there any solutions on the horizon that interest you? Uh, there's just some, some big flaws that I see over and over again, but I would say there isn't a lot of research being done. And because you always have to think about who's paying for research sure. and what's their incentive. And so who would be the person that would pay for mold research? Who would want to know? And who may, I don't know, because there, there's people who do some research to sell a product. Right. Yeah. So they have incentive, but what if their research finds out that their product, there's something better than their product, or there's a natural solution that's better than their product. Are they going to share that? No, they're going to stop the test. So that's, that's something that's happened in, in the health industry. I had some autoimmune diseases that I've actually reversed. And so I share that just to give people hope that, you know, when somebody tells you, you, you're, you have this, that actually there's stuff out there that we can, we can reverse. There's toxins a lot of places. It's in food, it's in water, the air we breathe for sure. There's people who are toxic. So there's stress and, and maybe it's not the people, maybe it's the job that you love that is actually stressful on your body, whether it's traveling or, or whatever the situation is. But uh, I mean, there is people who have relationships that they live in day in and day out and the relationship is very stressful and that stress reaction is not good for our bodies for then everything else. So it's, that's why it's also complicated is most people exposed to that mold illness have other things as well that are contributing. And so it's never one thing, but I did find in my health journey that there was something that a doctor had told me that was making people better and that the, 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 the research agency stopped the testing because it was something that people could get off, you know, they could go by themselves for low cost. Yeah. Healthy so why, is not profitable to be healthy. No, no. If almonds cured heart disease, then, <laughs> you know, if you it's eating not, almonds actually cure, helped you with heart disease, that would be great. But who's going to do the testing? You know, it would be, is the, is the almond growers going to test all this medical testing? Probably not, you know, so who else is going to, they're just going to say, nope, you don't have the medical testing to be able to say that it, that that thing is healthy or yeah. eating raw food or eating organic food or eating. I mean, I always say, don't, don't eat, can't, if you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. <laughs> you know well, that would eliminate half of more than half of our everything it would eliminate the clothes we buy if you can't pronounce it don't buy it the same with our cleaning products especially some of the food yeah all right yeah there's whole there i mean these people's a diet is just all chemical so it's what i would say it's food like products so i would i suggest people try real food and, and it's an adjustment, it's a cultural change. And, and that's definitely something we've done in our family over many years. It's hard to just do that cold turkey and it's hard to do it on your own when you live with other people that are, are not interested in doing that. So that's why it's complicated. It's all complicated. And why do some people have, an, have a health effect and someone else doesn't? For me, I feel like, well, maybe there's this thing that I talk about in a presentation called the fungus among us that I do, 
that it's called the, the canary in the coal mine. Have you heard that term? Well, I think I know the story. Isn't it like you take a canary down to the coal mines and, and because it's going to pass out or die or something if there's but, like toxins, but it'll do it before the people do. So then they know to leave. Exactly. Okay. So some of us, some people are more sensitive than other people and they're the canaries mm. in our buildings. And we can choose to listen to them and leave, or we can choose investigate further or we can choose to ignore it the question is what's going to happen and we have autoimmune disease we have alzheimer's we have parkinson's we have cancer we have all these diseases that are growing that we don't know what causes them and what if all these toxins in many different forms are contributing to people being susceptible to those things and it depends on your dna which one you might be susceptible to but what if you're going to like the DDT people didn't fall over and die because they walked into a bedroom that had DDT wallpaper. They didn't fall over and die after running after the mosquito truck that was spraying DDT. They didn't get sick until they were much as older adults. And then the a connection was tied together that why are they getting this cancer that you only get if you're exposed to these chemicals? And then they were, people have, were able to put it all together. People that were involved in the 9-11 cleanup and, and uh, rescue, you can research this, are dying in droves of bad diseases and they're dying young. They breathed in some really toxic stuff yeah. in all that dust of the buildings being demolished. Nobody knew at the time that that would happen. Right. Because it takes many, many years. And, and as I said, with my daughter's story, we moved in six months before. She didn't get better the day we cleaned the ducks. It was a gradual, gradual process over the year where, where a year later is like, oh, wow, she doesn't, she seems fine. And her hypersensitivity to being sick in other places got reduced over time. But that was just something that I could witness is how do you test that? You know, and who wants to be exposed to see if it's a, if it's going to be a problem? You know, where's your test case, and how do we know those people that anybody in the test case isn't being exposed on their own to things? There's just That's, so many places we have toxins. It definitely makes sense what you're saying that just because we're not reactive to one thing doesn't mean we're not reactive to something else, and that these things won't tie together, and that you won't be reactive later. So. Mm -hmm. I had a basement bedroom growing up with wallpaper and, and, and paneling in it, very 70s, okay? So I'm sure there was mold in there, but it didn't affect me then. You know, as an adult, now I'm very sensitive to a lot of those things. And I, I suspect that's part of it. At one point, when, when, we, when I was very young and we were just starting our family, we bought a house that we renovated that had a lot of bad stuff in it. And it had a, a roof leak that we didn't recognize. People, actually, young architect people were telling me, oh, no, no, that's not a roof leak. That powdery stuff on the ceiling, well, it was totally a roof leak. And, and so then we gutted stuff and there was lead paint and, you know, and we're wearing paper masks. I mean, all this stuff that you realize later, I shouldn't have done that. I'm okay now. I wonder if I'll be okay in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. And then, you know, you end up with some health issues and you never really know that they were connected to that thing or, or something else, but we can only surmise that some of these things aren't good and we don't know how it will end. And maybe those canaries, the people around us that are sick, we should be listening to because maybe, maybe they're going to have this immediate reaction, but maybe we're going to get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or something like that later in life because we didn't pay attention to it and we thought we were fine nicotine would be the same thing sure. doctors doctors used to brag about what brand of cigarettes they smoked and there were camel ads of what what oh your doctor uses this brand of cigarette and they weren't falling over and dying right at the time right it took a long time to connect the dots and, and then not everybody who smokes dies of lung cancer yeah you always hear those stories of Oh, well, my grandfather is in 95 and he's been smoking every day of his life and he doesn't have lung cancer. Great. But how many other people, whether it's secondhand smoke or, or just themselves smoking for a couple of years, end up dying of lung cancer prematurely? So yeah. 
there's so many different things in life like that that like those those sort of outliers can really have loud voices and influence how the majority of things are viewed even though it really shouldn't be <laughs> they really shouldn't have that much influence but as far as speaking about time frames of things i'm starting to wonder like what sort of time frame does mold need to get into your house because my boyfriend just moved into his new townhouse which is where i am right now and then his neighbor four townhouses down there was something about the the sealant on the toilet that wasn't done properly or something like that right and so it started to drip and it has now created mold mm -hmm. in his bathrooms and he's only been there as long as my boyfriend's been here which is march and it's june yeah it depends on the materials so there's some materials that i would term pre-digested mold food so there's some materials that we use in buildings or that are present in buildings Dust would be one of them. So the first thing I always recommend is just super clean. The next one would be paper, piles of paper, cardboard that gets wet. And it's, just, it's already so processed that it's just like, it, the mold can just like, oh, wow, this is ready to go. It's half digested already. We, you know, whereas solid wood that came from a tree it takes a lot longer for that. So our construction sites don't often grow mold immediately if they've been rained on, but that doesn't mean that there aren't dirty pieces that maybe have been sitting in another place that was not good conditions that could have mold growing on it. And that one rain activates it. But if it's nothing, if the wood was truly dry, usually we, I recommend using kiln dried lumber in new construction. If it was truly dry, it's not going to grow mold quickly, maybe months. I would say maybe mm. a year even. Paper on the backside of drywall that gets wet can be anything from, I would say probably 48 to 48 hours to two weeks. So it's really what the materials are. Is it possible that material has been getting wet and you didn't know it? Do you know yeah. if recycled materials are more susceptible to mold because they've already had a life is one thing and then are possibly more broken down than they even would be before or are they kind of rebuilt i guess i'm thinking more of like recycled like cardboard boxes but i guess it, yeah yeah there's a big heat component in recycling but yes the paper on drywall is recycled paper okay so imagine where you know where your all this recycled paper is coming from somebody's basement the pile that got out in the rain while the garbage was picking up the recycling you know, Which and it so, often does and is yeah, so yeah, they've done studies that the paper actually, and this is, I've seen these studies, I've read them, that some of that paper has stachybotrys in it, which is a very toxic mold species. I don't think it, it gets activated in that it's a problem because there's a lot of heat too. They're pressing this stuff with high heat until it gets wet. So those would be in the category. So in terms of recycled paper, absolutely, but regular paper is too. Paper is highly processed, but it is organic matter. Recycled steel, you know, it's not really the steel, it's the dirt and dust on the steel. Recycled concrete, it doesn't, I mean, they do put fly ash in the concrete. I, I that's a good question whether that would contribute. I, I don't know, but it's a good question. Fly but the concrete, it, fly ash, yeah, it's a, it's a way to get rid of fly ash, which is a byproduct of something else. And so you get, in, I'm a lead AP. And so in some of these green building programs, you get extra points if you use concrete with fly ash in it. Concrete, it doesn't matter, is a sponge, is a giant sponge. So if you have a sponge and you're holding your blue sponge or you put it on your table and there's a puddle over there and you inch your sponge towards the puddle, if it just touches the puddle, that whole sponge will wick in the water. Same thing with a paper towel. You can see it in a paper towel. So we have to think of our, no, our concrete is porous. Mm -hmm. Our brick is porous. Wood is porous. Not in the same way that a couch is poor, but in a way that if water gets on it, it soaks in. And if it, it needs to dry, we need to let it dry. And so part of this whole thing with sustainability is we're doing all this air tightness stuff. And so some of the things in our wall assemblies or our roof assemblies or our floor assemblies are not allowing drying. The mm -hmm. stuff's getting wet and then it just kind of festers. So the glues under floors, a lot of people who have slab uh, foundations 
and then they have vinyl over the slab or they have carpeting and a carpet pad over the slab. If that grade isn't done well, if the drainage around the building isn't, isn't good and in Colorado, it can be snow sitting on the side of the building that then melts and becomes, it just keeps wicking into the, the concrete that um, it's gonna try to dry to the inside. The inside's always drier than the outside in a rain event or when stuff's wet and then it gets trapped. So it's a little bit like putting your wet towel in a Ziploc bag of some sort, and then you're gonna seal it up. And how's that gonna work? You know, it's probably gonna be pretty nasty <laughs> in a few weeks. And that's kind of the same concept is we got water trying to dry, getting trapped by carpet tiles or by carpet pads, by, by anything that is impermeable. Sometimes it could be the wood floor with a vapor barrier underneath it and it gets trapped by that. And then there's dirt and dust there. And it's kind of getting kind of mushy there because there's water keeps trying to dry and it can't. And that's usually where that we start. So, in, but the, the food source could be the glue. It could be dirt and dust. It can be recycled. It could be the paper. It can be, so what is dust? It, it's de dead skin cells, <laughs> dead dust mites, fecal matters of dust mites, live dust mites, hair from animals and people and maybe dirt from outside is kind of in, in all of that, but it's organic matter. And, and so we really want to not have a lot of dust. And so I usually recommend people if they're concerned, start out by just pretending like you have a dust allergy and try not to have things that are dusty. So it may mean washing your sheets once a week instead of two times a week, every other or every two weeks. Yeah. Um, things like that, that you can really reduce dust. Carpeting may not be something good for people that are reactive because think about all those fibers in the carpet. Yeah. I know when you said the the pads underneath the carpet, I was thinking about my boyfriend's new townhouse and he has the carpet with the pads underneath it because he has a dog and our dog who actually just came inside the room. That's why I'm looking at him, but <laughs> he's been peeing on the corners of things. And I'm just like, at first we started doing just the little scrub that he's been using to like kind of bleach out the pee stains but then I was like this is this is just getting the stain away this isn't removing the moisture from yes. the carpet so now we put paper towels down and we're working on getting him trained FYI but we've been putting, <laughs> we've been putting the paper towels down and then putting like ankle weights for working out on top of those so it at least tries to absorb it but yeah I can't stop thinking about how it's it's just under there, like in the carpet. What I would do in that situation, you're on the right track for sure with blotting. And uh, there is a video that we have somewhere that's come out because we actually we actually had a leak in our, our cooler. We had a trip recently and I, I do a lot of videos when I'm traveling and we actually flooded the car with carpeting. And so blotting, what you're talking about with paper towels is blotting. I would start out with towels. They might be more absorbent and then blot, like you stand on them. I just you know, dry, new dry section, keep moving to a dry section and, and blot dry. Then we transition to paper towels, but we don't just leave them sitting there. We keep, you know, you could go through a whole roll of paper towels, but that's probably worth the money. And you just keep standing on them and you will be able to pick them up and say, yep, there's still moisture in there. Do it again or move it over to a different corner and do keep blotting until you are not blotting up anything. Baking soda can be good to sprinkle on it because baking soda itself will, will kind of absorb some of the moisture and then you could vacuum off the baking soda. It also will help neutralize the smells. What's underneath there? As far as I know, it's a pad. It's like a... Uh, but is it a second floor? Is it on a ground floor? Is there... Uh, oh, it's the second floor, yeah. So it's probably wood construction unless it's a really big building that it could be concrete. So it's if it's... It's wood construction. If it's wood construction, then the wood itself will soak in some water. And as long as you keep drying it, it's, there's a good chance that the wood will be able to tolerate a little moisture and that it will also be able to dry maybe to the other side, mm -hmm. um, assuming it's an indoor space. But I would just be trying to get it off the surface. And, and then at some point it may be, especially if it's on edges, it's not that hard to actually pick up the edge of the carpeting and kind of look underneath because there's staple, there's like little tack strips. 
and you can usually push it back down if you're like in the back of a closet or something, but in your case, it might be somewhere where that is a common accident location <laughs> where you might want to pick it up just even to let it dry and see yeah. how it looks under there and how does the floor look under there? Because you may not, you know, maybe the dog is doing that because it smells that other dogs have done it there or something. There's all kinds of possibilities in that realm, but blotting, you're on the right track with blotting. I would just take it to the next level and I would keep blotting and okay. just decide, here's the roll of paper towels we're using this time and have the TV on or whatever a movie or, you know, whatever, listen to your some podcast, listening to podcast and just keep standing on it and then keep getting a new one stand on it until it seems like what you're not, you're not getting anymore. That's what I I'm, do. I'm honestly going to do that when, when we finish our recording, I, I'm, I have a couple other things, but I'll probably like be on my phone, sending emails, like blotting with my feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's what we had a dog too. So you're not alone on that one either. So, but yeah, blotting, if you have spills and we all have spills, it's really hard to not end up with something happening. Blotting dry, but dry is the key. We need, if we things get wet, they need to dry. The other piece I would just say is that in some conditions, when it means it's like the structure, then dry is a measurement that we actually should be measuring. And, and it's not touch because some materials that are really porous, like concrete or brick or wood, they're soaking in all this water and it can take weeks or months for it to dry. And it may be dry on the outside, but the inside still holding a lot of water. Yeah. And it's gonna come from the inside through the outside again. And if we try to block that too soon, then we can create other problems that'll show up down the line. I've actually been learning a little bit about permeable concrete, pervious concrete. And then what's your thoughts on utilizing that? Well, I'm, I mean, I haven't researched that too much. All con I mean, permeable, I'm, sh I'm, I'm imagining that it means air moves through it, which maybe it'll dry faster. I don't know. Or like the rain to seep down into the water beds and water tables instead of. Oh, oh, a permeable paper kind of a thing or permeable. Yeah, no, that's, that's through the gaps. That's how that's working. That's good. That's good. Except that you don't want it to be doing that next to your foundation. So that's fine. We do want the water to go back into the ground and all this paved parking lots and, and, you know, masses of concrete is funneling the water at one place. Whereas if it all starts going in the ground where it hits the ground, then we don't have the same flooding because that's more like what it used to be before we paved. But we don't want that to be happening right next to our foundations where there's the likelihood that it will also soak into our concrete. Mm. Um, so you're talking about permeable pavers, which is permeable concrete pavers, which is mostly meaning they're still going to absorb water, but it means that there's gaps as opposed to being a solid slab. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, Cheryl, since we're coming up on time, would you please tell the podcast listeners and me again about all the courses that you offer on mold? You don't have to go into like grave detail because I know. Yeah, that. no, I'm not going to list them all because I can't, I can't even, I can't, I can't, <laughs> but you can go to my website at avoidingmold.com and under the education tab, there's also a lot of free stuff there. So I recommend people check out my, my blog posts. We're starting to connect those to videos. My YouTube channel, as you mentioned, I also have a public Facebook page. We're actually starting a membership. So I have a Facebook group. And that's called Avoiding Water Damage, Mold, and Toxins. And that's on Facebook. But more and more, we're realizing that almost 5,000 people in there. More and more, we're realizing that I can't keep up with that for free. That there's so much activity in there. And so we're trying to do a very low cost membership that I can be, one, the people in there will be serious about getting help, very low cost. And I would be able to, so if a hundred people pay $5 or $10 or $15, then, and I go there and answer a question that everybody can read, at least I, I can pay my assistance and I can pay for the services that we do to run the website and everything else. And it starts to become a better business model. As much as I like to give away stuff for free, I don't get stuff for free. So, so we have to charge. And there's a lot of stuff we talked about having a computer challenges. And, and I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm an expert at that. I've actually had to hire people to do this stuff 
I can't do or that are too hard for me to do. And so I have to pay them. They have to get paid. But in the end, it's all about us sharing information. So the YouTube channel, the Facebook group, get on my newsletter list, which should be available through my website. There should be a pop-up or something. That's where you're going to hear about the new stuff that we're coming out with. I share stuff once a month. It's not going to inundate anybody, but I share top topics and videos there. And that's where people will get, there's also a monthly sale of some sort that we share there. And, and that's where you'll hear about the, the membership site will be a beta initially. So it's going to be the lowest cost it ever will be. And I'm looking for uh, people to come on and let's try it. It's kind of like Facebook only without being on Facebook, without the ads. So instead of the ads, you, you may be a small amount to not have the ads. But if it's a, sm a smaller number of people that are serious, then I can spend more time there. And, and then we can start growing that and have a dialogue that that's going to be open to everyone. There's some people that don't want to be on some different portals anymore or social media sites. So it's a good way to be a little bit more independent, I think. Check that out. But avoidingmold.com, the education tab, get on the newsletter. You can, you can buy all this stuff at whatever price it is. We do try to be really affordable. So our goal is awareness and our mission is helping people. And, and so we are always trying to, trying to do that as best way possible. We just try to have, it's fun to have sales. So who doesn't like a sale? Uh, so. Nice little promo message and more people are like, oh, I might actually buy it than, than who normally would. Yeah. Get some new engagement. It's awesome. Yeah. So I have the build moisture basics, which I already write is a mini course that I highly recommend. And then I also have a build a safe home course for people who are building, interested in building, which is my premier masterclass that I do come on live. They have a special group in that course that I, this one is smaller. So I'm, when people ask a question there, I'm on it. And, and then I come on live with that one for every, every four to six weeks. And people can come on and ask questions live. They can send them in in advance and I answer them. And I'm going to be doing that in the membership site as well, doing live Q and A's. Cool. there so prerequisites for the building course for people or i would say the moisture basics is a really good start uh, i would i if i if i could if i was a college i would say your prerequisite is to take the moisture basics because i think it'll help with everything else but just know that we talk about all the ways buildings get wet and and how they need to dry and all and basically it's like if you're going to learn how to read you got to learn the alphabet and you have to understand the sounds the letters make. And, and we sometimes want to jump ahead and say, just give me the easy button. What's the answer? Is this house going to be good for me? And, and I'd say, these are all skills that we can all use the rest of our life in your in reality and all that kind of things where you can start looking at listings and say, hmm, that looks like something Cheryl mentioned. Maybe, maybe that's something that I either, I, it's a fix that I need to consider if I'm going to buy that house. Or maybe it's something that's beyond my means and I don't want to do that. Or then you see another and you go, whoa, this has got all the things Cheryl likes. I want to buy that house. And or at least I want to look at it. And, and you start to get a, some tools that, so the moisture basics, like over 10 defects in the course, in addition to some other defects that I discussed along the way, it's discussing the fundamentals. And then there's a PDF of 25. So you can almost use that and say, okay, does it have this? Does it have this? Like, got to remember to look at this. And we're working on other ways to do that, but that's what we've got for now. Well, my last question before I let you go is as far as, so you were saying like the, these are houses that Cheryl does like, these are houses that Cheryl has pointed out things are wrong with. Like, and, and in your experience over 30 plus years in architecture, what is like, the percentage of breakdown of that? Do you find that a lot of homes have good features or a lot of them have bad features or sort of like a mix? That's a tough question. I would say, I think we're doing, we're not doing a good job right now. I say the, I tend to be more leaning towards buying something that has good bones. that might be a little bit older, probably not before the fifties. There are good buildings out there before the fifties. There's good buildings at every age. Maybe that's what I want to leave you with. There's good buildings and there's bad buildings at every age. So, but I would say that we might've had more good buildings in the past, but then they get, they get worked on and they get additions and they get, oh, we added this and we did this. And then they also don't have maintenance. 
you know, so if you never got your teeth cleaned your entire life, there was a good chance your teeth might not be that good, you know. So the same thing in our houses, if we never change our air filters, if we never repaint, if we never fix things that are broken, you might not have a good building at the end of the day. And so it's very tricky in all that. So I don't, I wouldn't say that there's a slam dunk. There are, I should never say that there's not, there are good new buildings as well. I mean, but I would say that, that you, you need, people just need to start learning the, what they should be looking for so that we can help drive the new buildings to be like, you know, where people say, actually they do care what kind of insulation is in the building, you know, as opposed to nobody cares. Somebody was asking me about ventilation or they were asking me about fresh air. Yeah. And, and then the builders might, well, maybe there's a market that people who actually want non-toxic materials in their home, just like people go to the store now and there's a growing movement towards organic or non-GMO. And it might be the same thing in buildings where little by little, we just keep, if we keep asking, maybe there will be more people who see a value in creating what we're asking for. Yeah, I, did, I hadn't really thought about like building buildings in terms of the builders will build towards what the market wants. I kind of, I guess, not given it that much thought, but I guess I was thinking that, you know, they build what they need, which I get, like, you know, people are building these really big square buildings for like 200 units for apartment complexes. We need that. People are building townhomes and row homes because we need more housing in less amount of space. And then, you know, people don't need like mansion houses for the most part. Some people might might need that. But yeah, as far, I mean, I've thought about it in terms of non-toxic materials, but I have not thought about it in like the ventilation and mold prevention. So thank you for teaching me something new about eco-friendly homes today. <laughs> Good. That's always the goal. We all live and learn every day. So thanks for having me on. This has been great. It was a pleasure. Y'all, thanks so much for listening to today's show. As the last bit of information that I have for you, Cheryl's website, avoidingmold.com, you should definitely go visit it because they are having a flash sale throughout the month of July, which we are in right now. So if you've missed this month of July, they always have bundles going on in the education page of her website. So definitely check out the education tab. But if you are listening to this episode in July, they're having an amazing flash sale deal on five master classes for only $97. And those are usually $47 each. So usually those five master classes would run for $235 if you bought them one at a time. This time the five master classes are $97, just to reiterate. And you can simply go to avoidingmold.com slash flash sale. These five hours of in-depth video education include learning to use any moisture meter properly to find moisture issues, which for me as a real estate agent, I think would be super useful to learn. The second one is found mold learn the first steps to remove it safely and if you listened in the episode cheryl's daughter and her father removed mold in the daughter's house one time and so if they can do it you can do it the third class in this bundle is learn where mold can start and easy ways to clean for prevention any homeowner should take this class where can mold start and how to clean this for prevention the fourth class is know the basics of duct cleaning and avoiding common scams. Again, a class that homeowners should take. You need to know how to avoid mold. And when your real estate agent isn't around to coach you in your everyday life, <laughs> you need to know what to do when you have mold, how to avoid it, how to clean it. And then the fifth master class that's available in this flash sale bundle is learn the research and science on the effects of Thebes oil on mold. I have no idea what Thebes oil is, but it sounds really interesting. And I'm sure it's very informative and I would learn quite a lot. So go ahead and sign up for Cheryl's five master classes for $97. Again, regularly, if you bought these one at a time, they would be $235. You're basically getting two classes or you're paying for two classes and getting five. 
So thanks for listening. Again, avoidingmold.com slash flash sale. And if you missed that in July, go to avoidingmold.com and check out the education tab. Bye. Podcast listeners, as always, thanks for being a guest in my eco-friendly home today. I really hope you learned something new and I hope you find a way to implement this into your life so you too can create your eco-friendly home. As always, I'm available to direct message on Instagram at Moving with Madison. And besides my podcast, I provide services as a real estate change agent in the Denver metro area, specializing in helping you buy, sell, or create your eco friendly home. Something that this podcast is helping me get better at each and every day. When you come back over, please bring those cookies again. They were really good, and I'll see y'all next time.